Hi, thank you very much for inviting me again. I, I always like being, to, being invited once, but being invited back is a real compliment, so thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to talk about treatment and secondary prevention, and I've got my normal 128 slides, so we're going to move along a little bit. Um, just to say um, that I speak to anybody, and occasionally they pay my practice. There are a few topics which uh, industry have supported me on, and I've kept their slide backing, so you can tell when I'm using their slides. Okay, um, so one of the things I'm pushing at the minute professionally uh, within the GPs and the wider physicians is that we are in a very rapidly changing world of anticoagulation. There is lots and lots of new evidence coming out about these new agents that we can use to try and prevent clot not only in thrombosis but also in atrial fibrillation. Now normally when we hear this, we promptly see the headlines in the newspapers saying, NICE says no. However, in this situation, NICE is actually saying yes. And it's actually approving these drugs. It's giving them what we call a tag, a technical appraisal. And what a tag means is that the NHS has to pay for these drugs. It's not a, an option in your area. It can't be postcode lottery. It has to support this. Okay? Unfortunately, these newer agents have come out after the new guideline. So we're going to talk about how all that plays into each other a little bit. What they've also done is they also talked about how we should commission this. The NHS says it doesn't provide services anymore. The NHS is a commissioning organisation. But in saying that, it also does advise commissioning groups how to do this to try and make sure we don't get postcode lotteries and to make sure the best services are, are, are provided for patients. Now, I, I can feel you're all about to throw bricks, so I'm going to move on and talk about VTE, okay? So VTE is a big issue in general practice. And the reason it's a big in, I, I, I issue in general practice is because we all do actually worry occasionally about killing our patients. And the big problem with VTE is that if we get it wrong, we have missed a potentially life-threatening situation. So we know about acute DVT. We're very aware of it. So it is something that's in our mind. But I would suggest that there's only really four steps for a GP in sorting out their brain around thrombosis. One is to suspect it. One of them is to investigate it when they suspect it. When they've found it, they should treat it. But then they need to talk about what they're going to do in the long term. Okay, so that's all the GP has to do, four bits. AF's easier, there's only two bits. So what do we worry about? We worry about clots which is going to cause injury to the patient. So most of our DVT pathways are not about finding thrombosis, as Diana's really said. It's about finding that thrombosis which is in a position that it may do harm. That usually means north of the knee. So that's where we're looking for clot. We're not looking for clot very often lower down in the leg. And we, we can discuss in the breaks how significant that may be. Our big problem, of course, with thrombosis is that it's very common, okay? The symptoms, though, are incredibly common. I can't remember doing a surgery where somebody at some point did not tell me about pain in their leg, a bit of swelling around the ankle, but the fact that the right ankle's more swollen than the left ankle. So these are very, very common symptoms for the general practitioner, and we need to try and weed these through. So this is what we'd like to see, wouldn't it? A nice, big, swollen leg. This is a thrombosis. Actually, this is cellulitis. So actually, it's not as easy as we'd like to think. Even Google gets this wrong. Even Google. Even Google. Well, it's where I get, I get all the rest of the information. So how do we work this out? Well, the clinical guideline tells us how we should work at this. We should take a history, OK? So we should talk to the patient. We should listen to what they say to us. We should then do a physical examination. Then we should do a Wells score. Now, are you all aware of the Wells score? Because the Wells score is really quite interesting because it has a fiddle factor in it. I like things that I can get to agree with me. Okay? So if I don't like, think that the patient does have a thrombosis, I can take off two points. And if I do think they've got a thrombosis, I don't take off two points, and I can always find a bit of swelling. So I, can use, I think the Wells score does have flaws. I think it's easy to manipulate, and I think Diane has highlighted that as well. 
But it is a crucial part of the assessment, because once we've thought about it, we need to know who is at high risk. And I think what you'll find with many clinicians in the ED departments and definitely in general practice is they will, once they've thought about it, they will make the Wales score support what they've thought. Now, that's a good idea, because once they've thought about it, what they want to do is exclude the diagnosis. So what do they need to do next? They need to send off to the radiologist. And we've already heard how radiologists might not always be right. I won't tell them that, but um, what they're, they're conscious of is that they, their skills do have limitations. So for many, many years, we've been scanning the proximal leg, the thigh, when we suspect a thrombosis. And if that was negative, you were sent home, and that was it. However, we know that if you have a high suspicion of thrombosis and you only have one negative scan, you're going to miss a significant number of people who do in fact have a thrombosis capable of coming above the knee and therefore into a period of risk. So what we find is that we've got to look again at those people at high risk. And how, what do we find in that population? We find that over 10% of them actually have a thrombosis. So this is a significant number of people. And the new guideline puts that in place to ensure that a second scan is carried out in those high-risk people. But then we come to the treatment options. Now, the new guideline, came at, when that came out, there were no, no other licensed medication in the new cohort of anticoagulants to suggest that they should look at these drugs. So the guideline is very, very clear that it suggests that we use low molecular weight heparin, as we've already heard about. However, NICE understands that the evidence moves on. So when a guideline is published, what you have invariably done as a member of the guideline development group is the last time you've looked at the current evidence is often nine months before the guideline is actually published. So by the time the guideline comes out, it's out of date. So NICE also support NHS evidence, and the whole point of NHS evidence is to make sure that we are constantly reviewing the new information that's coming out and seeing how that should apply to the guidelines that NICE has published. Guidelines are exactly that. They're guidance in how to do things. They're not telling you, you must do it this way. So what we see is there's been a couple of studies, and I'm using rivaroxaban as the example here. This is a Bayer drug. There's also another drug that could be used in this way, which is a Pixaban, which is a Pfizer drug, but we're just going to use the Einstein slides because I like Einstein um, as a person. Um, so what Einstein did was it looked at VTE, and it looked at how we could use rivaroxaban, which is an, a tablet medication, a tablet anticoagulant, instead of using low molecular weight heparin and warfarin. Now, the study wasn't trying to show that it was better. It was trying to show that it was at least as good, what we call non-inferior. And what did the Einstein study do? It showed it to be non-inferior. And it also... Sorry, I'm having trouble moving on. Showed that it was as good as regards the bleeding side effects as well. So this was a non-inferior drug for the treatment of thrombosis without the inconvenience of having to go through a period of injections. What we also found is that in the study, patients seemed to prefer it to the actual normal treatment. Now, that, that's quite interesting because right, quite often you find that patients don't like new drugs very much. And it was doctors try, tend to have a bit of a bias against them as well. Okay? And Although not significant, it did have lower levels of bleeding, but not quite statistically significant. But not only did they do an Einstein on, on VTE in the leg, they also looked at pulmonary embolism. And again, what they were doing was they were looking for a non-inferiority compared to warfarin or, and low molecular weight heparin. And again, they randomised people in the same way. So they initially get quite a high dose of the river oxaban, and then it's stepped down. And what do we find in Einstein PE? Same kind of thing. 
Now, why would I bother to show you these slides if it was just saying exactly the same as Einstein VTE? And the reason is because there's a significant difference in the bleeding risk. So in Einstein PE, what we find is that the newer agent, the rivaroxaban, looks safer than our traditional axis of care. And if we look at Amplify, which looked at Apixaban, we see a similar issue. And when we look to the, other, the last of the 10A inhibitors, Adoxaban, we can see a similar issue, that it does seem safer when we're using it in the treatment of pulmonary embolism. So it does beg the question, why aren't we changing our pathways when the evidence base is suggesting there are new and, in some respects, safer alternatives? Well, maybe we are. So I come from Bradford, great place for a curry, okay? Dreadful place to drive around. Uh, I'm surprised that Diane doesn't visit Bradford because she could have a car accident there every day. Um, don't trust the traffic lights in Bradford. That doesn't mean they're stopping. That just means they're slowing down. Uh, okay. Um, so this is the Bradford pathway, okay? Now, it's a small, it's a, it's a complex slide. Why? Because this is actually the whole of the pathway. So there's no other bits hanging on. This is a referral form. It tells everybody what to do. What we find is it tells who we can use in general practice because we still, anybody we suspect of having a pulmonary embolism, we admit to hospital, and I'll get to that a little bit later on. Puts the Wells score there for us to see, but it's not only there for us to see, it's there for the rest of the pathway to see because there's a part of this which is essentially managed by the, ra by the, ra um, the radiology department. And it also tells me what to do. So it says take a history, suspect a DVT. If I suspect a DVT, I know that the patient is going to take at least 24 hours to be seen for an ultrasound. So I should protect them and start treatment. And we start them on the river oxaban there and then. Unless, of course, they're pregnant, where they'll be admitted to hospital for all the concerns we've already heard. Then it goes into the radiology department. And the rest of this happens automatically. So I don't have to do re-referrals. They're not saying, sending something back to the GP to miss, so the patient's missed. The radiology department goes through the rest of the pathway by themselves. So if they're low risk and they've had a negative scan, they can stop their treatment and go back to the GP to probably treat their cellulitis. If they're higher risk with a negative scan, the radiology department stops the anticoagulant and books the scan for them to come back in a week's time. And our DNA rate on that second scan is about 6%, which in any hospital system is a dramatically low non-attendance rate. And if you get a DVT confirmed, you don't come back to the GP for me to refer you to the thrombosis clinic. The positive DVT scan is the referral to the thrombosis clinic. So we're trying to get as many handovers out of the way as possible to make sure that patients flow through the system. Now, whenever you start a new pathway in general practice, I'll tell you, it can be an uphill struggle to try and get it implemented. Everybody always pilots things. I don't understand this piloting things. If it's a good idea, just do it. So in Bradford, we just did it. And the whole city turned over on a single day from the old pathway to the new pathway. The last time we looked, we have 94% adherence from the GPs to this pathway. Why? Because it's simple and it's nice for the patients because we all understand what we're doing. Of course, whenever you use a new drug, particularly when it's an anticoagulant, you've got to think of the safety aspect. So before we did this, this wasn't us GPs working in isolation. We're working very closely with Sam Acroyd, who's a, the haematologist at Bradford with an interest in this area. And he made sure that in the hospital, they had guidance of what to do if somebody's to come into hospital bleeding on one of these newer drugs because they may not have recognised it and made sure that all the emergency departments and the surgeons were up to speed about what to do next if there was a problem. So it was a total system change and we've been very happy with the result. Say Bradford area, about half a million in costs within its first year. So what does the DVT clinic do? The DVT clinic does what I, as a GP and a generalist, can't do reliably for all my patients. I have a list of about 10,000 patients. There's about five partners, six whole-time equivalents in that. I might see one DVT a year, confirmed DVT. 
how can I counsel that person about their DVT if I'm only seeing it so infrequently? Well, I can't do it well. So we get somebody who's doing it all the time because they're going to do it better. So we have the thrombosis clinic. It's based at the this Bradford Royal Infirmary, which is right in the heart of our city. <clears throat> it's run by the pharmacist who actually has been running the warfarin clinic for the last 20 years. So somebody with an experience of anticoagulants under the supervision of, of Sam as a haematologist. And we try to do as much as possible one stop. It's all based in the GP clinical system because we need to look after the patient in the long term. So what's it doing? Its major thing that it's doing is it's teaching. And we've already heard about the importance of explaining why we're doing things to you as people because it helps you understand why and it helps you like, consider the pros and cons about taking the medication. Now, one thing I'm just going to focus on is this decision about duration of anticoagulation. So, NICE is very clear about how it wants to discuss this. And it wants to think about it as your risk of recurrence. But it wants you to be involved in that decision. Because, of course, there's risks and benefits. If you're on an anticoagulant, you're more likely to bleed. If you're not on an anticoagulant, you're probably more likely to have a, uh, have a further event. When we say probably, actually we can prove in our studies that actually if you have ongoing anticoagulation after your thrombosis, your risk of a further thrombosis is reduced. Unfortunately, we can also show that your risk of bleeding is increased. But what is my perception of risk and what is your perception of risk may be out of kilter. We know that doctors worry a lot about bleeding. We know it in the AF agenda as well. But actually, you may really worry about dying of a large clot. And we have to try and balance those two issues up. So we know that if we continue the treatment for a thrombosis over six months, you have a lower recurrence rate. We know that if we do it indefinitely, you have a lower recurrence rate. There's actually a little very faint line here. Okay, so you do get the risk coming back of thrombosis, but it is much, much lower if we treat you indefinitely. But this is at the cost of bleeding. So we're back to Einstein again. And Einstein also did a study looking at long-term treatment. Now, in this case, it was a placebo study, so it was comparing long-term treatment with people taking nothing. Now, remember that I, the, one of the advantages with these um, newer agents is that they don't require the intense monitoring of warfarin. They don't need an INR. There's no equivalent to that. These drugs are more, if you would, a bit like aspirin. The dose you take is the dose you take, and we know that they work at that dose. David's wondering how I managed to get away with saying aspirin. Um, so what was the, this, uh, the Einstein extension looking at? It was looking at the things we were worried about, thrombosis, but also the risk of bleeding. And what it showed was that if we used the drug in the long term, we had far fewer event rates. Well, that was at the cost of a bit of extra bleeding. Who should make the decision? Should it be me or should it be you? Should I counsel and allow you to make the decision? And I would argue that I am, in a modern healthcare setting, a counsellor of healthcare, not the person who makes the decisions. So if these drugs work, and in some cases in thrombosis are safer, why aren't we using them up and down the country? Now, this is a, a nice map of England. Uh, we've chopped off Scotland and Wales. And what we're looking at is the prescriptions of the non-vitamin K antagonists, the, the newer agents. And what you can see in red is areas where the use is very, very low. And this is, of course, not only in thrombosis, it's in AF. But we also see these hot spots, which are in green and blue for some reason. Um, there's Bradford. I can tell you that this is Terry McCormack. I can tell you that this is Beverly Hunt. And what you can see is that where there's advocates, and those advocates have really been fighting for the use of the newer agents, the non-vitamin K antagonists, in VTE, not only do we find nice pathways of patient care, but we also find an uptake of these agents to stop stroke in AF. 
And we've now done a piece of work, just out of interest, that shows if you look at exception reporting, where the GPs have decided the decision's too hard to make about making, putting somebody on AF on an anticoagulant, if we look at the exception reporting, it almost overlaps perfectly that red band. So this is having consequence not only in thrombosis, but in the treatment of other conditions as well. What else does NICE say? NICE says that we should try and think of a reason why you've got it. So we should try, in those people who we don't know that they have a cancer, we should look for a cancer. And we should talk to people about it. I was running a patient group in Bradford, and I suddenly found out there was a rumour going around Shipley that if you were on warfarin, you couldn't have sex anymore. Great form of contraception, but not true. Yeah, it's important that these questions are answered. And as we've already heard, that you have somebody you can go back to to answer the questions that may come up later because we don't always think of everything we need to know at the time. And it also talks about post-thrombotic syndrome and what do we do about post-thrombotic syndrome. And as we've already heard, the evidence is starting to evolve in that area. Just wanted to finish with another bit of NICE. NICE guidelines are guidelines. They can be followed or not. And that is a big problem for us. So what NICE goes on to do after that is it writes quality standards. Now, quality standards, if you want a stick to beat your local CCG or health board with, the quality standards are the stick, okay? Because these are measurable. And so whenever you see a guideline that applies to something in your care, you should also look and see if you can find the quality standard. And thrombosis has nine quality standards. Statement one is I should suspect a thrombosis. And if I suspect it, I shouldn't sit on that. I should actually do something about it, which seems reasonable. If we're not going to get the um, scan quickly, then we should endeavour to do it quickly. We should do something else. So they actually say if it's going to wait longer than four hours, that we should actually treat people. So that's what we're doing in Bradford. We should get offer people stockings. The evidence base not quite as good as it was, but it was there in the, at the time of the quality standard. Look for cancer. Don't look for thrombophilia if it's not going to change the answer to the question, should you be on long-term anticoagulants? And if you are going to look for thrombophilia, make sure it's looked for by somebody who understands the answers and can counsel the patient about what those results say. I would argue that's very rarely a GP, and he's often a haematologist or somebody working in the field. People with active cancer actually talk to them about being treated, rather than say, well, you've just got cancer. And here we go at number eight, and I think this one's really important, which is ask the patient what they think their risk is and treat along their perception of risk not along the clinician. We should not be in a system where you say you have three months of anticoagulant and then you stop, irrespective. We need to talk to people about whether they wish to continue. And there's a little bit more about cancer in there. So in summary, what should we be doing? GPs need to think about thrombosis more. It's commoner than we think. If you suspect it, assess it. Refer it into a structured pathway to make sure it's there. The treatment options are changing, and I would like to sit, think that in the next few years we will see the end of low molecular weight heparin in the treatment of thrombosis, with the exception of pregnant ladies who can't have these new agents. The patient is crucial in determining how long you should receive an anticoagulant. It is not the decision of the doctor, it's the decision of the patient being counseled by the clinician. And always watch NICE, because that's where the power really lies. Thank you very much. Okay, time for a couple of questions. Um, yeah, go on then. Hi, Matt. This is great. That's great for people in Bradford. But what is happening? What is it going on to cross the rest of the country? And from South Sector. Yeah. Which you know is. That, that, that was, that was, that was really deep, there? deep, deep yeah. red. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've spoken to my GP Pat as well. It's a priority of the patients for. The choice, yeah. Yeah. So the question, question is, why is, it, why is Matt 
great example not being rolled out, rolled out across the rest of the country. Um, it is moving out, and, and there are there's, there's different models. So um, Beverly have a slightly different model here, but it is about changing the system, and we are pushing to change the system. And to be fair, Thrombosis UK is pushing at that as well. What really is interesting is in the cash-strapped NHS, NICE even say it's cheaper. So why we're not doing this just purely on a financial ground. Um, one of the nice things in Bradford, of course, is, well, not nice for the patient, although it's good for us learning, is that we've now had people who've had a thrombosis before the new pathway and after the new pathway. And I'll tell you what they prefer. They think the new pathway is the only way to fly. Question in the back, sir. Can you shout? Yes. Uh, oh, uh, yes, you can. I've got a question that uh, I have a personal interest uh, from a friend of mine who died as a result of this. Why aren't um, antithrombosis stockings being used with sticky bits on the soles? I don't really don't know. know. I mean, they are, they're made now. Sticky bits on the soles to do to what? Like your totes to stop your slipping. To stop people slipping. Oh, really? My friend died as a result of oh, really? slipping uh, in the hospital because he didn't wear his slippers. Now, one reason that's given is that it encourages people not to wear their slippers. I know that's a ridiculous... No, no, I agree with you. Well, I, I've never heard that before, but I think that's something you should think back to the stocking manufacturers. Thank you very yeah. much. Can I ask one last question before coffee? You must be starting to accumulate information on bleeding and how the, the, yeah. how the bleeds are treated. Yeah. I mean, um, we relate that? Well, that? so... so what we've seen, what we don't know is the denominator of yeah, the warfarin, yeah. of course, because that's a bit lost in the system. We know from the pathway that we've had in the last two years, we've had two bleeds um, on the pathway. Both patients successfully resuscitated. Uh, both of them had um, a combination of the non-vitamin K and an anti-inflammatory drug at the same time, which we shouldn't have done. Uh, so the learning and the ongoing education into the city is that you should never use an anticoagulant and non-steroidal at the same time. Of course, there'll be minor bleeds, nosebleeds and such like, but the, 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 the hospitalised bleeds only to no intracerebral hemorrhage. Thank you. Thank you very much.